Thank you for tuning in to today's full episode of the Breaking Changes podcast. I'm your host and chief evangelist for Postman, Ken Lane. With Breaking Changes, we explore specific topics from the world of APIs, but through the lens of business and engineering leadership. Joining me today, we have Farah Jatubo, co-founder and CEO slash CTO of Okra. Farah shared with me a pretty compelling view of why API First is how the next generation of applications will be delivered in Africa, helping me see beyond the API-driven startup momentum that we have here in the United States. Let's, uh, let's start with the basics. Who are you and what do you do? Uh, my name is Farah Jatubo, and I am co-founder and CEO of Okra. And, what does Okra uh, guess, do? Yeah, sure. Uh, so with Okra, we're an API. We enable developers and businesses build personalized digital services and financial services for their customers. Uh, our goal essentially is to digitize financial services in Africa. So what what brought you to this opportunity? Like, where, what's been your journey to get here? I mean, I, I grew up so funny, like I, I was born in Nigeria. So uh, Okra, I should mention, is uh, primarily based in Nigeria. We're a Nigerian uh, fintech startup. Uh, and um, I was born here, but I grew up, I spent most of my formative years, I spent it in Saudi Arabia. Um, and then I moved to the States later. But uh, a lot of my childhood was spent like in front of a computer. So I think that like my love for computers like started when I was like five years old on a big Macintosh, like the ones where like half of it is like connected with the floppy disk drive. Uh, and just like really amazed about like all the games I was playing and like, how did this even get on this computer? Uh, and then when I went to school in the States, I moved to the US when probably when I was like eight years old. And I think my first, uh, I used to spend, you know, there too all my time in front of a uh, computer and then uh, when i got to uh, middle school they were like you know there's a, a class on programming and i was like yeah yeah i want to do that like i want to see how to get all these things like onto a computer myself uh and then from there i just kind of started building back in the early days of like yahoo geo cities like building like websites for kids to play games and like aggregating like a bunch of games from like all over the web when it was like really still new uh and just really i think that's when i like i got a passion for building stuff and like building these products and um you know fast forward uh, i went to school for computer science uh i graduated and just started working in corporate america quickly realized Yep, that's not for me. And then uh, shifted uh, and started uh, working for startups. I mean, I've always been an engineer, but uh, just wanted to like kind of be a bigger fish in a small pond and kind of like build really cool products like across the continent. And I think um, I got to, you know, I moved back home in 2014 to Nigeria and um, I was really like, you know, it, it, it's so, it was so, it blew me away the amount of opportunity that was, you know, that was here in terms to build like things that just didn't exist yet. And like coming from like being able to use like certain apps like Mint or, you know, so on and not being able to use that. Like, I mean, I, you know, when I moved back, like if I wanted to, you know, have an apartment, you pay for the whole rent the whole year up front. You know, like if you're buying a car, you buy the whole car up front. And I think that like, you know, these kind of, you know, these kind of, building blocks made me realize that like there was a really big gap when it came to like data access and this infrastructure, this like actual layer to build like real financial services. Uh, and my co-founder, David, like he had like a really strong thesis on like the fourth industrial revolution and like what that meant. Uh, and then we just really decided to team up and forces and kind of build Okra. And like, we just started connecting the banks as like a, you know, as an MVP to see if it, it actually was even possible. Uh, and then, you know, once we were able to do all of that, um, uh, we soon like started thinking, you know, how big this can, can this get? So I think in the U S I mean, there's a lot that we take for granted in, in, in with our, how long our financial system's been in place, what's been happening. But as far as the tech yeah. evolution, the stripe, the plaid, the mints um, have, have kind of laid this, this foundation. And a lot of us, refer to this as the API economy, but I would yeah. say what they enable is actually the, in the API economy. So it's it's the gig economy, the delivery, yeah. the food ordering groceries. Yeah. So what yeah. what what does what does Okra enable and 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 how does it differ from from what we know in the US? Is I'm sure it's a lot of the same. There's an overlap, but yeah. what's different as well? Yeah. Yeah, so there's an, definitely an overlap. You know, we're still, you know, we still have the same, you know, we still want access to the same type of financial services here on this continent than anywhere in the world. So whether or not that's like spending, growing, 
you know, managing your finances. You want to be able to do that digitally. You want to be able to do that in a very now, you know, type of way. Uh, but I think what's different is the, you know, maybe the access points that you would do that through. So like looking at USSD, for instance, like uh, as a, you know, an access point here on the continent, or even, you know, the, the, the methods in which you would do that with, you know, would be a bit different. So, you know, we found that like, uh, we're building, you know, we feel as though like most of the, you know, most of the products that's going to be created from Okra don't even exist today, you know. So what we're building for is to enable the next generation of financial services in Africa. You know, we want to, you know, our goal is to connect a billion Africans to the global economy. So we feel as though like, you know, how far this can go is, you know, is tied to this, you know, this this infrastructure essentially. So is the is the existing kind of banking and finance sector in Africa like ready for this and game for this? Are they on board with, with your vision and program? Yeah, no, I think so. I mean, definitely. Uh, we are right now, you know, we see, we have financial institutions, fintechs, banks, you know, as our customers uh, as well, because, you know, the, the conversation across everywhere is digital transformation. You know, like even the bank wants to serve their customers digitally. You know, the way to, you know, reach more customers is not opening more branches. It's, you know, it's serving them online. Uh, and so I think that there's been a lot of, um, you know, it, it, it hasn't, there hasn't been a lot of opposition against what it is that we're doing because uh, we really, the aim is to essentially enable, you know, the financial services sector, the banks and so on to actually just comp- to generally build, you know, this, you know, personalized, truly personalized solutions. I think the next, you know, if you look at like the fourth industrial revolution and personalization and AI and so on, and like the way that we're moving generally, like, you know, you have to, uh, you, you're not going to you're not going to win if you don't if you don't you know, if you don't uh, if you don't know how to use these tools and do these things as well. Kind of love the early days of Stripe, Twilio, Plaid. Mm-hmm. There was the there was a, a heavy kind of leveraging of developer ecosystem. I mean, this is why we have developer relations. We have yeah. uh, based what I do. Is there uh, enough of a developer ecosystem to, to build that next generation apps that you need in the markets that you're targeting? Oh, I think a hundred percent. I mean, like, I think that some of like, I mean, if you even look some of the you know best engineers in the world, I think I'm on this con are on this continent, you know, and I think that even if you see generally, like, as we're moving into this, you know, post pandemic or this, you know, pandemic world, you see the shift around, like even the remote work culture and the, you know, and, and, and where people you see, you know, people building in all types of companies. I think that uh, we definitely have a large developer ecosystem. Um, we have people that are building, you know, uh, you know, so many, so many products across a wide array of, you know, financial services today. And uh, you even see that by even the, even the sheer amount of funding that's coming onto the, and coming into the continent as well. So I think that uh, we're, we're at that, uh, this, in, you know, this influx stage where um, this, these rails are being built, these, you know, this, the, the, this infrastructure is being built, whether or not it's, uh, you know, what we're doing, whether, you know, in payments or in data or, or whatnot, you see these rails and then you see that enablement of these, you know, financial services continue to scale and, and become bigger. So you even have, you know, fintechs that were using us uh, yesterday or, you know, were not using us last year, but today can do something completely different now that they, now that they are. So I think that in combination of the fact that that ecosystem does exist there, the, um, the developers that want to build now having the actual tools necessary, necessary to do that, it's, you know, where that kind of plays a part. What's your guys' uh, process and approach to the feedback loop around this? How do you, how do you keep your finger on the pulse on what people are needing to build and, and keep up with that? No, I think that um, it's just being being able to be reactive. That's a really good question. Like, I'm sorry, being uh, responsive, not reactive, like moving out of like a reactive uh, mindset, uh, like even like, for instance, Postman, like, we're you know, we're talking about this podcast right now. It's something that we use internally, like to kind of like sync up teams between like QA, documentation, engineering to kind of work together, because once you can start like documenting, you know, your routes, not just internally, but like not just externally, sorry, but internally. So a lot of people look at documentation and look at like, you know, uh, that usage of like, what do developers see of your product when they're trying to integrate this? But there's another aspect of what do engineers internally see, you know, in the product in order to maintain, to scale, to fix, to, you know, to understand it. So I think that um, we're, um, we're, we're, we're using, we're, we're taking a very response based approach, whether or not that's through QA, whether or not that's through customer engineering, whether or not that's keeping a complete customer feedback loop going at all times, uh, just to make sure that not only do we understand what customers need in order to, 
um, to scale their businesses. So like what new things they're looking for, but how do we help them, you know, maintain and scale their existing, the existing things that they're using? Yeah. What, uh, what skills, what, what skills or traits do you look for in a developer adding to your team to help, help y'all build out your, your whole platform? Um, that's a good question. I think that like, uh, you know, we look for people with like a big drive, you know, like ownership, accountability, drive like that innate, like, I want to say maybe even conviction, you know, because I think that, you know, what we're building is, is super tough. It's, it's hard. Uh, and, you know, we're creating infrastructure and rails where they didn't exist before. And there's always a fire burning. There's always a million fires to put out. So like, you know, having that ability to find people that are, you know, this is what they would be doing, um, whether or not, you know, they were, you know, today or tomorrow, they just, they have this passion to build. And uh, I think has been, um, has been good and just being able to find people that are like truly excellent at what they, what it is that they do, you know, uh, uh, being able to say, you know, you're excellent in this, you know, in QA, you're excellent um, in product, you know, you're very excellent in services and tools or customer engineering or whatnot, uh, finding people that are like masters of their craft as well. Um, and then just understanding that like, the best people build the best products. Like, so really being, you know, taking that approach to just knowing that like the world is your, you know, is your pool when it comes to that. So, so you're targeting the entire African continent or, or is it, are you just focused on specific markets right now or what's, what's your scope look like in this moment? Uh, so right now we're in Nigeria. We're also um, uh, expanding and piloting in like Niger uh, South Africa, Kenya, um, a few other uh, countries as well. So, our goal has always been for Africa to compete, you know? So for us, you know, this is, you know, it starts here in Nigeria, uh, you know, um, and uh, it moves into making sure that no matter, you know, where you are in Africa, we enable you to, you know, have access to that global economy. Do you have to deal with a lot of government interference, uh, processes, bureaucracy? What is, what is the, the government landscape look like for y'all? So for us, um, we've always maintained like the fact that like we ride on like user consent, you know, um, we have something in Nigeria similar to GDPR, which is like NDPR and just making sure that like, regardless of what, you know, everything we do is helmed on the fact that, you know, the customer decides, they decide who they're connecting to, who they're sharing their data with, um, et cetera. So um, with, because of that, you know, we haven't uh, seen, you know, much like much like any type of like regulatory government, like um, um, thing in that sense. Uh, and I think it's also just to look at the fact that, you know, here, um, you know, it, it, we just make sure that, you know, this rides on, you know, customer consent at the end of the day. Yeah. And you're just building on, I think the, the right foundation early on. So, exactly. uh, where we started, I would say in the U S without those needs and those privacy concerns, and we're having to reel things back in a little bit yeah. now. Yeah. How, how do how do you how do you get the word out about what Okra is building and doing? How, what's your most effective communication tools for spreading the word? For spreading the word, I think that um, we, I mean, I think one thing we've it, it's it's one of those things that had to be built, right? So it's one of those things that like there's a general real need for. So we make it easy for you know people to find us and like you know onboard and get started and start building. But we also do, of course, like business development and outreach as well to like you know to businesses that are uh, that um, need financial service. So any type of business that's trying to serve their customer digitally, um, you know, is our customer. Uh, and I think that uh, also word of mouth, you know, when you're uh, when, you know, someone can go from doing something in a week and doing that in 10 seconds now, you know, they, they tend to spare the word a bit uh, as well. So we also get a lot of uh, word of mouth as well um, when it comes to that. What What are your biggest challenges in in taking your your business to, to where you want to see it in the next six months to a year? Six months to a year? I guess, uh, I guess it's always people, right? Like, so... Uh, you know, we're growing um, and with that, we're scaling. Like I always say that, you know, it's it's not only that you want to scale your business, you're also scaling your technology. So like the, getting the right people to do that um, and getting them in early in a way where you can uh, they can start adding like value very, um, you know, uh, is is is, you know, it's one of those things that we think about all the time. So for us, you know, we're consistently hiring, uh, especially around like product engineering um, and, um, it's one of those things where it's like, you have, we, we kind of understand what it is we're building. We understand like, you know, our roadmap and how it needs to get there. And so now it's like placing in, you know, the actual, you know, the actual, uh, great people that'll come and, uh, help work on that problem. Yeah. The, the, the people side is, is always the challenge for no matter where you're at as a startup, as an enterprise, 
ninety five percent API problems are are people problems and people and people so, problems exactly. Uh, yeah, so I mean, a, a lot of us like to think the the perfect technology solution or perfect API design is going to save everything, and and there's so much more to talk oh, about. So um, yeah. What what does the security landscape look like for for you? What are you what do you think about when it comes to security? Oh man, we just we made sure like security is something that we like we thought about a lot in the beginning because you're dealing with people's data, you're dealing with people's you know sensitive you know kind of information, and so you want to make sure that like uh, they feel one like um, it, it's it's I think it's like an, even a double edged um, thing now because you're looking at your end user, your consumer that wants to feel safe, you know, as you're using their favorite fintech product and um, and you know and connecting their financial account to get whatever service, uh, and then you have your your client, you know, that B two B to C, so your B two B and uh, that person that wants to make sure that like their their customers' data is safe in your hands and and you're actually you know your um, they, they can trust you because the name the customer knows is theirs. Um, and I think that um, we made sure in the beginning that we built this with, you know, the with financial services, like the top you know standards in mind. So whether or not that is, you know, with encryption, whether or not that is with um, uh, with our uh, architecture, like our DevOps architecture, for instance, or uh, whether or not that's even with even like um, uh risk and mitigation around even building the products or whether or not that's, you know, pipelines for, because one of even, uh, even aside from security, one of the biggest risks is like, you know, your service should be working. So like, is your API up? Did it go down? <laughs> and, and making sure that you can, you know, you can handle that as well. So uh, for us, we just really, really took a lot of those things seriously early on and made sure that, you know, um, these things uh, were things that um, would net would would not come back to haunt us later, and so you know, knock on wood, the, it's, we've been able to do that thus far. Yeah, smart investing in security early on, and 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 I think the privacy, as you talked about before, really focusing on the customer owning their data. Yeah, those are the two biggest areas I see folks. It kind of bites bites folks, but also I think because you're API first, you you prioritize the APIs. I see a lot of companies. Yep prioritize mobile apps, the the implementations over the APIs and the APIs yeah. kind of become shadows. And so mm -hmm. I think that's one of the the benefits of being API first that 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 yeah. clearly you, you you've identified early on. So Yeah, hundred do, do you feel like do you feel like you're you're innovative and early with your startup or is it is it are, is there a lot of competition for what you're doing? What are what are you at the right time? What how's your feeling on that? Uh, I think I mean we were definitely I think we were at the right time. I think we're you know a bit early. There's you know a few uh, startups. Uh, that, I'm sorry, a few uh, other startups trying to do things similar. This popped up, but you know for us we've just always taken uh, a very like measured approach to what we're doing. A very like. Um, you know, just sticking, making sure that we're sticking with our first principles, we're sticking with our, you know, our North Star metrics and making sure we continue to like drive home on those. Because for us, a lot of these things um, are really uh, subjective because you want to make sure that your customers want to make sure that, you know, their service is working, they can scale with you, your coverage, you know, you have the most amount of coverage. And so um, just, you know, kind of leaning into what you were talking about before about being API first, we've just made sure that, you know, we've made sure that uh, just understand that your your customers are using you to be able to get their service at the highest amount of deliverability um, possible um, and also make sure that they're growing uh, in tandem as they're doing that. And so we've kind of um, kind of just kind of stuck to that in terms of like um, timing. I think we're just right because, you know, a bit earlier, uh, you know, a lot of these, you know, even banking applications, the whole Internet banking is quite new. So, um, uh, you know, and when I say new in, in the last like what um eight you know eight years eight nine uh seven seven to nine years so uh i think we're just at the right time when you have that amount of penetration needed to actually um show you know that this is something that people want to use you know at scale yeah and, and it sounds like you're really building this as a as a product so you got that feedback loop it's got to have that that value that yeah. benefit to actually people in the in in their daily worlds in their businesses and and, and not just fintech for the sake of fintech because i've seen a lot yep. of fintech emerge in europe and us in those early years that, that you talked about that's you know seven to yeah. nine years and they just didn't feel like they were 
they were open banking because it was cool and trendy. And yeah. so having that feedback, that API, that's a key aspect of API first is having that feedback loop. So you're building products, not just technical interfaces that, yep. that seem cool or seem attractive. Yep. So. 100%. I think, yeah, when you first start building that, right, you think about it like, of course, inevitably, when you first start building, you think about what you, you know, what what this product is in your mind, right? Um, but if you don't continuously build that customer feedback loop, essentially, you're building for yourself, you're not actually building uh, for, you know, long term usage and for actual, you know, actual lasting, uh, lasting usage. So we always make sure that like, we, of course, you, you have your roadmap, and you understand what it is you're building, you build that, you know, the, those, that, that step by step process, but you have to be able to allow it to be influenced, at least, you know, by like in, influenced by the, the feedback loop that you're getting to make sure that, you know, you're continuously focusing on the things that people want to use today and the things that are important to their businesses. Do you feel like, I mean, I'm, it sounds like you're following kind of know your customer type things. You're, you're in tune, you have these feedback loop, but do you feel like you're, you understand what, what your customers are needing and what their users are needing to the point where you're going to be able to just keep iterating out and, and bringing the next generation of services to them? Uh, I, I think so. I mean, I think that like, you know, you, you get to the point where, um, you are one, you're helping them uh, stabilize and scale existing th things they're using, but then seeing where uh, value added services come about. One of the coolest things about being this type of uh, uh, company is that you get to view, um, you get to, you have access to like the, the nodes that you need to build almost anything, you know, like, so once, I mean, it's data is the, is the, the key to, to product generally in the sense that like, if I can define this, um, this aspect, I can build this tool, I can build this service, I can build this product. So I think that uh, what's interesting is a lot of clients figure out, like even we, as well as our clients figure out things just based on usage as they grow generally. So like this thing that they tried, oh, it had this result. Okay. What does that mean? Okay. Is there a product out of here? Okay. If you can, you know, if what, what question would you need to be able to answer about your customer in order to change, you know, to increase your, you know, your, the usage of your customers today, for instance. And then that's how you start getting, you know, building products out of these, uh, out of these conversations and out of these loops. So you, you, then you take that and then you look at your roadmap and you'd say, okay, we're actually thinking about doing this already, but maybe this is more important that we do today. Maybe this thing that we wanted to do today, we do later uh, and so on. It feels like I would say one of the hallmarks of the first wasn't just fintech it was it was several waves of of tech startups we, when you hear the term data is the new oil data how important data is that the the value of the data was was not very creative or imaginative it was like straight up just selling the data to someone hey we've got all this yeah. data so we're going to like sell yeah. it to someone but you what yeah. you're talking about sounds like kind of the next generation is you have this data, you have this insight and yep. visibility, and it's not to yeah. sell it. It's to, it's to understand and, and build what's yep. next and, and shape it yep. into the next generation products. Yep. A hundred percent. Like, I mean, the next, you know, the fourth industrial revolution is all about, you know, personalization, AI, you know, understanding. Uh, and there's been a lot of, uh, you know, businesses and fintechs across the world, not even just on the continent that have been sitting on amounts, you know, of their customer data, not doing, not understanding that thing. How do you start serving your customers in a way that they want, you know, more personalized way that is in tune with what they need um, in order to, you know, to build for them rather than just building essentially for, you know, just services that you want to build. It's in understanding that, understanding that customer. If you know, you know, what type of food they, you know, what rec restaurants to recommend, you know, if you know, um, you know, like, you know, Netflix wins at, you know, being able to tell you the next show you want to watch, you know, very quickly. And so that's, that's the kind of thing that we want to enable, you know, people to be able to build, uh, not just build for your customers, but also um, build something personalized for them, something that they actually want to use. So one concern I had with the, the previous incarnations of, you know, what I just described with data as Noel, but a lot of this had hallmarks and feels like earlier waves of, of industrialization that weren't very fair and equitable. They were pretty exploitative and extractive in, mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. Yeah. So do you feel like this, this approach that you have has the potential to be more fair and equitable when it comes to these, these, this next generation of digital resources that define who are, what our culture and society is about? 
A hundred percent. I mean, because this time we're putting we're putting the control in the in the user's hands, right? Like the this is now your control of your data and how. So now this is all about making your life easier, your life more personalized, and and full access to even revoke this at any time. You know what uh, what's different is that you know you're not taking something without consent or something that you're sitting on uh, that you just have access to. You're saying, hey, you know, you use this app and you also use this app. You've connected your, you know, your bank here. Do you want to share that information here as well uh, and and help you uh, get value from, you know, uh, whatever value added service this person wants to give you? So I think that it, it, it definitely puts the control um, into the user's hands, into, you know, into their hands and it lets them know that you're in control with this and you're in control. Of, not only are you in control of this, but you're in control of what, where and how it's shared as well. Yeah, and that extends not just directly to your payments and um, your finances, but how you earn that or make that across the gig economy and sharing economy, yep. um, how you spend it, how you how you invest it, what you do yep. with it, it, it. It gives you more control over it across the board. Yep, exactly. Even more insights for yourself <laughs> to know how to do that better. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think we need to spend a lot as as tech startups, we need to keep investing in educating end users. I've been long been a, an advocate of, hey, you should know what APIs are, and not not that you're going to build APIs or 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 uh, build an app on top of APIs. It's just it's yeah. kind of like the rest of the banking system. You don't have to understand Swift and all these other things, but <laughs> yeah. you should understand who has access to your bank yeah. account, right? You should have some fundamental. Yeah. And a lot of people look at me like I'm crazy, like no one's going to care about APIs. And I'm like, well, I mean, no one cares about the electrical lines or the water lines. But when you don't have water coming out of your tap or you don't have you know, electricity out of that yep. plug, you, you can't really care. So, yeah. yeah. So, um, so I'm a big, big fan of educating folks about why APIs matter, not not just for a specific specific area like payments, but across the board. It's how your healthcare data, course, it's how it's all of these things. So. Um, yeah. so where, uh, was it, was, was it pretty easy to convince your investors of the opportunity that exists in Africa? Is it, is it pretty clear to them? I definitely, I, I think so. I mean, of course, you know, it's a, it's always a, you know, a little dancey place. So it's not every investor that gets it, but I think the ones that we definitely wanted to make sure we aligned ourselves with investors that really shared our, you know, our thesis, our viewpoint and our understanding on like how impactful this is going to be. Um, you know, on the continent, not just now, but like, it's not even about the value today. It's the value, you know, 10 years from now, you know, what is, you know, how, you know, how big uh, will financial services, you know, um, be in, on the continent and what is, what is going to be that infrastructure that's powering that. Uh, and um, I think that, uh, you know, it was once you're aligned in that way, it, it, I think it, it, it's pretty easy at that point. How close are you to the to coding and to the tech as as leadership now? Are you doing less less technical things and more businessy things? Are you still doing a balance? Where do you find yourself? Oh man, um, it depends. I guess it depends on time and fundraising times. It, it's probably a bit different, right? But um, generally, I'm I'm still an active um, coder. Like I still actively um, contribute to the code base um, and. Uh, obviously, as we grow and solve our people thing, uh, that becomes less and less uh, as time goes by. But I mean, it's been I mean, it's really exciting. I mean, it's so, always something to build, something to work on. So uh, and uh, even in the in the in the issues and the in the, the QA and the process of learning, like, uh, you know, I spend I probably four hours of my day on Postman, just like uh, going through routes and debugging and so on and so forth. So like, I think. Uh, I'm still very, I'm still very close to it. Um, but I think that will probably change over time, but I'm still very close. Yeah. Well, keep, uh, keep sharing feedback on how, I mean, one of the things I love about Postman or I'm trying to keep pushing it is it's very much a troubleshooting and debugging in this world of APIs, but how can it help us keep seeing our API infrastructure as it grows, as it scales, and, and, you know, I mean, observability is kind of that word that fits that, but it's a yeah. little different. You know, how do you see the pipes? How do you see how they're working? So if there's more dashboards or tools or interesting things we can share with you as, as knowing Postman, because this is the hardest part for me right now is I love and, and breathe and live in Postman, but I'm constantly riding that elevator up to the C-suite to talk to large enterprise organizations. And then I ride the elevator back down and I, I, I have trouble keeping balance um, between the words I use. And you're, you're at that sweet spot where I don't think you're big enough yet, but you're, you're starting to have to wrestle with some of that. So 
if there's things we can provide that give you more observability into things, but from that, you know, that you're used to, let us know. I'm happy to oh, provide. Oh, 100%. Oh, definitely. 100%. Yeah, no, but it's a, it's been... It's been great so far, even like the evolution, just watching the evolution. I remember when I first started using it versus today. And uh, now we kind of see it like span across a lot of even the parts of our business. So even even looking at people recruiting mock APIs, things like that. So it's been uh, it's been fun kind of getting into the tooling. But I think there are probably maybe a few things here and there. So I'll, I'll think about it. Yeah, feel free. Feel free. You got it. You got a direct line now that we've done you. Yeah, exactly. Gave us some of your time for the show. You got a direct line feed, <laughs> as part of our feedback loop. But honestly, I mean, this show is is part of that feedback loop. I I will carve up this show into an index and, and do the transcriptions from it. And then it all kind of goes into a central planning um, feedback loop as far as what we're going to how we're shifting it, because we're seeing more roles emerge along the life cycle that are product managers, engineering managers, which is why we kind of started this show. But of course, business and technical leadership for startups and then increasingly for large enterprise try to find what's what makes sense, what, what words and, mm -hmm. and fits with their incentives. So um, as you expand and grow and uh, um, please share share your thoughts. It's it's valuable. Will do. Awesome. Thanks. Um, so how has COVID changed your world at all? Has it impacted? Were you guys virtual before? Is it is it shifted um, your, your reality much? Funny enough, so like COVID literally, like especially the um the uh shutdown happened <clears throat> literally as we closed our first pre-seed round. Uh we had just ran into the office. <clears throat> everybody was like in the office and we realized, oh, everybody has to go home. <laughs> and so that's kind of how COVID happened. But I think that it really kind of helped us. Uh, it, it, three things happened, right? Like COVID had this big shift where it kind of pushed forward and propelled forward like technical, um, you know, like digital transformation, technical, technical innovation generally, because people had to realize I actually physically can't leave my house and go to the bank and get my statement and take it to this company. So how am I going to do that today? Uh, but then in the, in the other token, then you're now growing uh, pretty fast because you have all these people trying to take it, you know, take, um, uh, like try to build with your tool. And then you're trying to essentially support them at the same time, have a loop at the same time, skill at the same time, hire at the same time. So those are kind of like the, the things that happen, but I mean, it's a good problem to have, I guess. And so, uh, I think that that's the second thing. And I think the third thing generally was that, uh, it enabled us to have to, um, really think about not just like just remote work, but distributed work. And, and why I say distributed is just still feeling like, you know, you're working in a collaborative environment, but you know, people are sitting where they're sitting. Uh, and uh, because we had to think that about that early and we, we invest a lot in tools and, um, and in um, automations and, uh, and, and, and just generally service and tooling. I think that we are able to kind of walk, be able to kind of focus on other things that were important rather than like scrambling to figure out, you know, why, you know, our, our, you know, our customer feedback loop is not, is not integrated with Slack, for instance, or anything like that. I feel like, uh, as an economy, uh, the, the, the healthy, vibrant economy of the future is going to need okras at the front line with their finger on the pulse of the data, understanding in markets and to be able to innovate out ahead and adjust and kind of be the shock absorbers for not just COVID, but any, anything that's going to come along. We need that type of, of innovation and yeah. agility and flexibility to, to, to make for a healthy economy. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah. I think it's a, uh, it's pretty critical. And I think it's one of the things I've seen with regula regulation in, in the UK and, and Europe is starting to change that behavior. I wouldn't say the big banks care enough, but they're starting to pay attention to more of the, the, these, these mid market kind of smaller startups who are making change because there's opportunity there. But um, I think also they see it, it makes for uh, a healthier playing field, a healthier ecosystem. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm, I'm too 100%. optimistic with the Bar Barclays of the world, but. <laughs> no, I think over time, even the Barclays of the world will realize that, you know, um, they have to be able to use the kind of same tools as like, you know, uh, the fintechs and the startups as well in order to kind of like now, you know, we're creating, uh, I mean, of course, in some parts of the world more than others, uh, more like, you know, even playing fields, like if you look at like Stripe and, you know, and, and, and bigger companies and so on. But I think that generally speaking, every company is, is a, you know, financial services company, every company is a fintech and, you know, and, and the sooner they realize that, the, the better as well. 
Yeah, I'm I'm having conversations pretty much every major bank right now and some and it's fascinating to see the ones that are just like, all right, we need to figure out this API thing versus the ones that are like already on an API contract. You know, everything's API contracts these days. They're they they're getting yeah. it, they're understanding, and you can really tell the difference of who's gonna be around in, in 10, 20 years yeah. and who's not. Yeah. What what advice would you have for yourself? Because I know you've made your rounds in some of these these big enterprises. What I mean, what advice would you give yourself back in the early day before you even started working? Would you still do it and, and kind of pay your dues and go that route? Or would you give yourself advice like, hell no, hell no, go do a startup? Uh, I think I would still do it because I think sometimes you got to get a little bit of what you don't want to know what you do want. Uh, and so mm -hmm. there might be an alert to like, you know, work for a big company or so on and so forth. But I definitely think that like my my work style and like my personality just jives better with, uh, you know, with a startup in the sense of just like, you know, move fast, iterate quickly and just try to like, you know, and, and you know, throw things at the wall to, you know, what sticks and then build a plan around that. Essentially. Yeah, I, I'm I'm but with I'll you. That's why I'm at. So. Yeah. That's, I mean, I spent, I worked at SAP for a number of years and I, I just dreaded those years. Those were some unhappy years, but I definitely learned what I don't like. And, and it definitely yep. shaped what the world, the world that I live in now, which I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm very thankful for. Cause I get to um, yeah. basically talk to fo folks like you on a daily basis and I, and I get to have great conversations. So yeah. what, uh, where, how do you stay sharp? How do you, where do you get your new, more information? How do you, you stay in tune with what's happening? Oh, man, I think uh, I like to consume things. So whether or not I'm consuming it, you know, via reading or YouTube or, or whatnot, like I, I, I do a lot of like I, I, do, I like a lot of I try to take in like holistic news. So just like news, like in every like from every viewpoint to kind of, you know, inform myself. Uh, and then in terms of like staying sharp, even just on the tech side, I, I uh, we, uh, we joke a lot at Okra that we're like some tool obsessed people. So we even have like something like the tool party. Uh, and so I'm always like, just looking at what's new, what's getting built, you know, how are people thinking about building it? I, I like looking through like API documentation for fun and just kind of see how people are building things and how they're making, you know, connections because you get, you know, you get ideas of even how to, how to think about how you're scaling and, and how to think about what you're doing and, uh, good ideas and, uh, inspiration can come from, you know, any type of company it doesn't even have to be the same you know the same thing at all yeah i that's what i really love about the api space is um, partly because i'm a little add i i lose i have a very short attention span so i can all ooh look environment apis ooh look payment <laughs> ooh healthcare i can there's always something and then look uh you're in that nerdy realm, like me reading documentation, you can learn a lot from someone's portal, yeah. like their developer yep. portal and how they do things and how yep. they, they don't, they don't do things. So yeah. um, I'm on the same page with you. Um, no, I, I love it. I love, I love watching what people are building and learning from them. Me too. Me too. Like, it's always something where you're like, wow, like, or coming up even with like, uh, one of the things that's really cool is like, you know, internally even coming up with things to solve our own problems, right. Internally, just to make those things faster, where, you know, ordinarily you would think that, oh, you're building an API and all you're doing, focusing every day, is building CRUD routes. <laughs> but no, you're actually also essentially um, also building the tools and services for like that you need across your, you know, across your organization. So it's so for myself with the, you know, it, it helps me even focus like, oh, I can work on this and I can work on this. But you're all all of these things you're doing are still for the greater good. And they're still for like, you know, they're still pushing towards the same objective. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. And that's kind of where I've taken Postman's has this, we're an API platform. Now you can stitch together using any service that you depend on because it's all API driven. And I kind of see the, because I'll be using existing infrastructure like GitHub or Jira is APIs as part or AWS APIs part of my infrastructure. And then I'll stitch together with Salesforce and others, but then I'll, I'll have other APIs I've got to build and CRUD routes I've got to do. And it feels like I'm stitching uh, some sort of fabric or quilt or something of, of everything. And, and it gets to a point where it all works together. Not always, but most of the time yeah, where it's got a, a pattern and, and it, and it yeah. looks beautiful, you know? Um, yeah. So yeah, I think, no, I, I think love, startups. I, like, yeah, no, I was just going to say, I, I really love that idea of like um, one of my favorite things around tools is like how tools coexist together. Right. So like the mm -hmm. ability to like use this API 
and then use this one to do this thing to ultimately do this thing, whether or not it's like to solve something as simple as like, you know, scheduling, right? Like, uh, like not, not, and not even from a calendar perspective, you know, that's genius on its own, but even from a perspective of like, um, I want to be able to block time or have its recurring thing or automatically, you know, intuitively move my meeting. You just see a tool the next day that is essentially solving the specific problem. So I think it's also cool to see how people are solving like the things that are grinding their gears the most uh, and then throwing that into like, you know, tooling that like, I'm sure, you know, like, like tooling and services and products and companies that, that grow. So it's just the, the evolution of the problem and like the, and the first, you know, iteration of the API that doesn't work <laughs> is always like, you know, the, the first hurdle, but then, you know, when you kind of, Oh, it's working a little bit now and then you kind of move and, and see how big it can get i think it's so exciting like it's just super exciting yeah no and i love these business or real world problems not only business problems is what i really love apis about so tomorrow one of the episodes that we're recording is is a a, a, a group in chicago they are helping women and primarily women uh, uh black and brown women to uh, and, and of a certain part of Chicago to maximize yeah. their worlds using APIs. And this, a lot of them oh. are like, we're, we're quitting our jobs um, because we have kids at home. We have to do something and we still need to make money. So what we're going to focus on is calendaring. So how do you, um, with all the meetings, all the class schedules, all the, the things that the juggling they're having to do as part of their lives to either just, be a be a be a parent in today's COVID yeah. world with with kids, yeah. or try to yeah. start a business or have a side business or a side hustle. Like, how do you maximize calendaring to yeah. to to do yeah. what you need to do? And I think that's a fascinating yeah. problem right there. Yeah, I think that that's definitely fascinating. I mean, there's so, and that's the thing. It's like you can think of any problem you have and and find a way to solve it. And and I think that. Um, you know, before we moved into trying to solve things with like products and now this, you know, ability to solve things with APIs, which is still a product, but like, just like from the, you know, this, the, the enablement aspect is really, is really, is really cool as we move in the API economy is growing worldwide. Generally in some places it's, you know, it's, it's much more further along than others. But I think just generally when, once you start uh, enabling, you see like multiple things built out of this thing, you know? So like even the idea of, that you were just mentioning of enabling, um, you to maximize maximize your scheduling imagine how many different products now come from that you know just that general idea yeah yeah and just and just i would say an underserved market of needs it's like yeah. i just need i need to know my i need my calendar to reflect across multiple calendars outlook google different yep. things get help me prioritize help me see what matters help me see what's my family yep. Um, there's a yep. lot of nuance in there that I think we could serve yeah. and provide value for that, that maybe we don't see yeah. as, as Google calendar or some, you know, yeah. startup yeah. that's dedicated to yeah. this. So, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I really like that world. I think the solving real world problems, cause I'm, I'm getting tired of tech in my older age. I'm much more critical. Uh, I want it to help me. It's got to make me happy. Otherwise I'm not, yep. I'm to do tech for the sake of tech anymore because i've got to add this. value in some way yeah yeah so um ending on a personal note what is what's what what drives you motivates you what keeps you a happy person beyond uh okra and, and apis and tech oh uh i mean definitely family uh friends uh, i have my son and my husband so like uh, i spend as much time as possible which is limited sometimes <laughs> uh but uh uh, and also what kind of drives me as well is just, I, I think that like, just generally speaking, I always make the joke that like, I don't mind being a robot and kind of seeing how like everything unfolds. And um, um, I think that uh, that just the, the idea of just like continuously consuming what's going on in the world around like tech and so on and so forth. Those are the kind of things that just get me excited. I just love, regardless of even this, just love seeing people build and love seeing people solve real problems. Um, and of course, of course, spending time with friends and family uh, as well. Yeah. So. yeah. Well, it's good to hear. I'm, I'm in a similar boat. I don't have a lot of hobbies or creative. I, I wasn't really good at anything until I started doing APIs. And all of a sudden, I'm, I seem to have found something I'm good at. And I love doing so. I don't do a lot of else. I mean, I hike with my dog and my 
my um, uh, child is she's grown and in university now, so she doesn't need okay. as much as she used to. So, um, but it, it's, so I just work and and I love doing this. So I'm I'm right there with no, you. No, me too. I think uh, that like my favorite thing is you know building. And so regardless of whether I was doing this, you'd still still see me trying to solve some random problem that I have uh, in the code base as well. So it's it, it's what it's what drives me. Well, like I said, I think we need more folks like you out at kind of the front lines of, of the economy, because I think that feedback loop that, that y'all have in place, I think is going to be real key when it comes to meeting the the a- actual needs people have on the ground when it comes to, you know, the day to day things that matter. So, so yeah, I appreciate 100%. you being out there. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate your thank time you. today. This has been great. I'm glad we could finally make it happen and make it work. Um, you're in, in our, in our contact list. So I'll be reaching out about future episodes and future opportunities. And, uh, maybe if we come to your area, we can, we can collaborate on some things, but oh, I appreciate it. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks so much for the time. It's, it's been excellent. It was a great conversation. Thanks again to Farah for stopping by. You can find out more about Okra at okra.ng. You can subscribe to the Breaking Changes podcast at postman.com slash events slash breaking dash changes. I'm your host, Ken Lane, and until next time, cheers.